Hello, hello and welcome to the second session on the second day of Wacom Career Days, the online event where self-employed artists and studio professionals like today will share their insights and experiences on how to pursue a professional career as a creative. Today we have a very exciting session waiting for you, but before we jump into the talk, I will go through some of the basics with you. Our session will last approximately one hour, give or take, with a dedicated Q&A session at the end. We will be keeping an eye on the chat, so feel free to send your questions at any time to wish. Sometimes it will get picked up during the conversation. Um, we're all here to learn from the experiences from our speakers, so please be kind to each other and do not spam the chat. If you have to leave early, don't worry. The session is being recorded and will be available on Wacom YouTube page in the following days. Those of you who have registered will also receive a follow-up email with a summary and additional information next week. We see you socializing and sharing your art accounts on the chat, and we really like that. Just as a reminder, this stream will be on until around 10 p.m. this evening, uh, and you will have plenty of opportunity to network between the live sessions. So we kindly ask you to keep the chat clean for the session, um, and only focus on uh, related questions and commentary during the presentation. A quick reminder and an introduction of your host. <clears throat> so for those of you who know Wacom and who have seen us in the various online events in the last couple of months, welcome back. It's a pleasure having you here. And for those who are new to the session, um, Wacom has been around for almost 40 years and we are the pioneers of digital pen input technology. So. Whenever you want to create on your computer and you realize that using a mouse or trackpad just don't cut it, you should try using a digital pen. Wacom Career Days is also sponsored by MSI. With more than 35 years of technological expertise and a never ending drive for innovation, MSI satisfies the needs of all types of end users with product lines that include, but are not limited to notebooks, desktop computers, monitors, components, and chassis. A world leader in content creation, business and gaming solutions, MSI's newest content creation series products, Creator and Prestige Notebooks, PCs and monitors are not only powerful enough for even the most demanding creator tasks, but are also known for its pleasing and award-winning designs. To learn more and discover the right products for you, visit msi.com. And a little bit of marketing and advertisement from our side. And to show our appreciation to all of you who take the time to be with us today, we have an outstanding offer for you. By using the discount code CAREER20 in the Wacom EU or UK eStore, you will get a 20% discount on our top products, including Wacom Cintiq, Cintiq Pro Families, the multiple award-winning Wacom Intus Pro Family, our newest 13-inch pen display, Wacom One, and our exceptional all-in-one pen computer, Wacom Mobile Studio Pro. This is a limited time offer, so you don't want to miss out. Don't forget, the code is CAREER20. Well, so finally, it's about time that we start. My name is Jeroen, and I'll be your host and moderator today. In this session, we have Tendai and Vanessa from Triggerfish Animation Studios. And they have a much bigger track record than would possibly fit into three bullet points, but Pendai, uh, passionate about art and business, where art and business meets, holds an MBA in music and creative industries from Henley Business School, singer songwriter, um, apart from being an artist here at Triggered Fish, and she's written and directed musicals. Currently a development executive for Triggerfish Animation Studios and Netflix first African animation series. And the other speaker with us today is Vanessa, um, an award-winning producer of live action and animated films with 20 years of experience. With Triggerfish co-produced Africa's two most successful animated feature films, Adventures and Zambesia and Kumba. She mentor, mentors young producers and creators through the Story Lab, the Berlinale Durban Talents Mentor Program, and the current Netflix Writer Lab. But that's enough from me for now. And I will hand over to Dendai and Vanessa to start the session. Enjoy and have fun and see you later. Hi, everyone. Um, 
as uh, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, just a quick correction. I joined Triggerfish after the massive success of um, a Mama K's Team 4, which is Africa's first Netflix animation. Um, so I'm very lucky to be part of a studio that has blazed the trail for um, African storytelling in the animation medium. And I work in the development department. So with the stories um, and uh, the visuals, and I'm part of the team that helps um, get creators ready pitching and working out the look of their whatever story or show and figuring out that story and getting them ready to stand in front of executives as well as walking the journey with them as they make whatever piece of art they, that they're making and I work alongside the fabulous Vanessa Sinden. Hello everybody, thanks Denai. Um, it's so great that you've all joined us for this session. And um, when the team at Wacom reached out to us, they had asked us for, for a session just about, um, you know, some, some tips and some helpful advice on how to pitch a new project to executives. And as a studio, we've done quite a lot of that. And uh, we thought it would be quite a good fit to take you through some of the, some of the ideas and the, the pitfalls and the successes and, on how to do that. Um, and just to talk a little bit about the kind of projects we're, that we're currently making um, and, and projects that are unique and diverse and authentic and original to Africa. And, uh, and also to share a little bit about our studio. So that's what we have in store for you. Um, I've been with the studio for almost 13 years um, and it's been an absolute joy. Um, I've been able to produce mostly everything that's come from the studio, which has been so exciting, um, along with the an Oscar nomination for our Revolting Rhymes. And if you haven't seen it, it's the Rural Dahl Revolting Rhymes. There's two short films, which are phenomenal. And um, then almost an Oscar nomination this year. Um, we just got pipped at the post for The Snail and the Whale, which is a TV special. Anyway, and multiple other awards that our studio has, has a, been a, received for all our films. Um, I'd love to just introduce you a little bit to Triggerfish. And um, I'm gonna share, share screen. Triggerfish Animation Studios is a studio based in Cape Town, South Africa, the very tip of the African continent. And we also have a new studio up in Galway in Ireland, which is uh, one of our new ventures in the last year in, in COVID-19 in the lockdown, we ventured to Ireland. A little crazy, we are kind of those people. But here's a little clip of our story and who we are. Once upon a time, on a beautiful farm in the city of Cape Town, a small group of passionate artists and mavericks wanted to bring their stories to the world. And so, Triggerfish was born. We love animated movies. We grew up rooting for the same heroes. We were swept away by the majestic world and felt our hearts in our throats when all was lost. But it never was. Everything was possible, and soon we attracted other artists, writers, directors, and filmmakers who shared the same passion for storytelling, and Triggerfish became the continent's leading animation studio. We built a studio that produced two world-class films that screened in over 150 countries. Our stories were translated into 27 languages and seen by millions of people in theatres around the world. Our talented artists and technical crew brought Africa's fresh creative voice to audiences everywhere. We're passionate about great stories with rich characters and a fresh aesthetic from the unique part of the world that we call home. At Triggerfish, we're making our dreams come true. We still have many more stories to tell, and this is just the beginning. That's who we are in a nutshell. Um, and I'll just take you through some of the projects and some of the things we do at the studio um, here in South Africa. Um, aside from the two very successful first feature films, and still today, two of the most out of the top five, the most successful films ever to have left the continent, are Adventures in Zambezia and Kumba. And if you haven't seen those, definitely try and get to see those. These we started making from 2009. 
and are just fantastic, um, fantastic representation of of films that from the continent that have flavor, that have amazing music, amazing vocal talent. Um, that's Adventures in St. Peter and uh, Cooper, which is a story of, uh, about a, a zebra that lost its stripes. Um, you may have heard about this one, and this is set in, in a beautiful Karoo landscape that uh, we have here in South Africa, very Californian type of landscape, and really a story about a traveling trio and how they have to face um, some very big, big villains and foes. And so those are our um, those are our two major films that we produced quite early on in our in our studio history. And what we really discovered through our journey as Triggerfish Animation that um, in order to make amazing authentic stories and content and to find investors to put money into them, we needed to find amazing talent who had those original stories. And that as a studio, we had some great ideas, but there were so many other people with talent and we could open up some doors to opportunities and we wanted to find a way to bring talent and opportunities together. And so in 2015, we started a development division at the studio that essentially kicked off with Disney and, um, and our team with a story lab. It was a, a, a lab that essentially asked and invited African creators to pitch us their stories and ideas. And 1,500 entries came in, just a bit short of 1,500. And we saw so many ideas for feature films and TV series. And it was an amazing experience to have all these great ideas pitched at us. And what we realized from this experience is there are some amazing ideas for films and TV series. But as African talent, we weren't pitching ourselves or our stories very well. And so that's really an interesting uh, discussion as we go into how to pitch better. And as talent and as ideas people that you are watching, um, that you might have ideas and you'd want to pitch and just get a sense of how to do that. Our development team worked on so many different film ideas, uh, television series ideas, and excitingly, um, two of our TV series from the 2015 Story Lab have been picked up. This one was picked up by Disney Junior. It is no longer called Ninja Princess, it's now called Kia, and had, it has been greenlit. So it's only taken, what is that, six years in development? <laughs> Which might seem like a long time, but that's really um, how these things take in terms of timing. And the other exciting show that Tenzi I mentioned earlier was Mama K's Team 4, which was, uh, it's not Team 4, not Super 4, it was then. And that's been picked up by Netflix with creator Malinga Mulindema in Zambia. The exciting thing about these two shows is they're both female led and creators. And how exciting that uh, we've got women leading very strongly in the space um, of development at Triggerfish. Anyway, moving on, we've got this amazing development team of which Tim Dye is a part of leading. Um, and at the studio, we, we really have seen it necessary over the years to offer online free courses because what we've found is that it is very expensive to study. And I'm sure it's like that in, uh, anywhere else in the world. And if you don't have the resources to study, you might be at a, dis at a disadvantage. So we offer up this amazing package of free online material essentially to, um, to young creators going, is animation the right career path for me? Am I more interested in art or animation or technical or programming? And trying to essentially help you find your feet as, as new people to the animation industry. And um, so that's one of our divisions of our studio. And then of course we have a, a nonprofit um, called the Triggerfish Foundation, which essentially helps to discover and develop talent on the continent, um, which has led to multiple projects in our development team that kind of all work hand in hand. But that in a nutshell is Triggerfish and who we are. Uh, as a company, we've been around for 23 years. Um, but that aside, the, the, the reason why we're very much here today is really just to share with you some ideas on, on how to pitch and how to pitch to executives, how to pitch to audiences, how to pitch in a crowdfunding campaign online. And Tendai and I are just going to bounce in and out of a some thoughts about pitching and we've got some great creators who are also going to be sharing all about their experiences and um, their videos we're playing as well. So, so stay tuned. I mentioned earlier that um, I, I've had the pleasure of having thousands of projects pitched um, to the Triggerfish development team and I've been a part of that. And what I've really seen is that, that we, we have these great ideas, um, but we really sometimes don't execute very well. And it almost feels like we let ourselves down. And so that's just a, 
the key in to figuring out how to pitch, how to pitch your idea well, and how to pitch perfect. Essentially, your whole pitch is basically your um, pitch to an executive or your pitch to somebody in a live audience or online, um, trying to pitch for development funds or production funds is essentially what will get you the job, what will get your project noticed. And if your project is really outstanding, um, you do it quite a disservice if you haven't prepared or if, you have, if you're not ready to pitch in that space. But we'll just take you through some ideas and, and, and go from there. We'd love to hear from you as well if you have questions. I know there'll be some Q&A at the end. So great idea is nothing without a well-crafted um, pitch. And I think a lot of people have great ideas, but as I mentioned earlier, it, it really can't just be there. That's almost like the easy part, following through on that great idea and um, a story, artwork, world building, following through on that and essentially getting it pitched to potential people who are going to give you lots and lots of money to, to produce that. That's the key, right? So what we suggest is, is really just to test your idea. And if you've got this great idea and you're not sure what to do next, it's really just to test the idea and make sure that it is an idea that has, has captured people, that has got people going, great, I want to hear more. Um, get some opinions from people who you respect. Um, listen to their feedback. If 80% of your, if people who have listened to your pitch or read your pitch say to you, a certain character is a bit flat and lifeless, then if 80% of those people feel that, then your character possibly is flat and lifeless. And test, test this because before you go into that high pressured meeting with an executive at Netflix or you, you kick off a crowdfunding campaign pitching to find um, audience to, to throw money at you, you really want to test your idea and make sure that it's rock solid. Um, and in terms of like, some of you might be artists, some of you might be writers, some of you might be, be animators. What, we can, what we'd encourage you to do is really to look at partnering up with someone who's really great at writing and solid pitch document for you. Look at partnering up with people who are great artists and putting together some great pitching materials. Um, what you'll find is there's hardly ever one person who can write and who can be an amazing production designer or art director. It is really animation is all really about a team collaboration. Um, we'll go through a little bit as well in researching the best partner and ideal platform, how to pitch your project. Um, and because that's quite key, that's like essential to, to pitching correctly and pitching to a captive audience. And then we just want to encourage you to hold nothing sacred. Um, often you might feel like you're pitching your best idea out and you get a completely blank stay back and you've been to 10 meetings and they're all no's. You know, don't hold it sacred. If someone has a great idea for you from Disney Junior, you listen with both ears open. Just great. That's interesting advice. I'll consider that. You know, hold. Don't hold your idea sacred. Um, be open to to feedback and some input. We've got a very first um, video queued for you, and I think Tenda, you're going to lead us into that. Yes. Um. Thanks for those tips, Vanessa. And I think a lot of the time. Um, you know, we're speaking as producers and people that are helping creatives put together pitches even, right? But at the end of the day, it's the creative that has to pitch. You're going to have to pitch your own ideas yourself. So we thought it would be a great idea to actually chat to some of the directors and um, writers in our network that have pitched many, many times. Um, and you can hear from them directly what they did to prepare for the pitches. So We'll get that video going, the first one. And just to let you know, the group in, um, includes um, people that have done animation, the advertising space, feature film space, short films, animation across multiple mediums. But you'll find that what they say is pretty similar. So we'll play that now. What are the things you ask yourself before you even start putting together the thing? So the first thing is that, are we even the right people for the job? There are multiple instances where we had to turn down certain certain opportunities for us to pitch because it was simply not our thing. And I think that's very important for you to, first of all, you know, not pitch for things that you can't deliver. How can this idea work for the person I'm pitching it to? If we have an idea, is it easily understandable? Or are we just nerding out on our own? What's my strongest angle going in? And then I lean into those. 
as much as possible. How do I organize the visuals and the information mm. such that it flows mm. and that it also helps me remember what I'm supposed to say? Know who you're pitching to and and really make sure you understand them and what they're after. Do a bit of research or if you're told this, these are the people who are going to receive your pitch deck and read it, check out who they are, the things that they've done um, personally and professionally. We always come up with a powerful statement to draw attention so that people can then listen to you. And then we always end with a powerful statement. What's the best way, and maybe you can give an example, of bringing yourself into a pitch? You're hoping that you're gonna resonate with that person and that they're gonna be generous and ask you something more personal that's gonna enable a bit of an exchange. Some people do it, some people don't. But in my experience, especially at Annecy, most people do do that because they know that that's what works. So it's making sure there's always like a personal piece of you inserted into that space. I think producers want to see who you are and they want uh, to get a sense of you as a human being and what makes you tick. I'm not always the most confident person. How do you mentally prepare for that, knowing that that's something that you battle with? What, what are you doing? What are your techniques? Say it out loud because sometimes things seem so interesting and cool in your head. But when you will say it out loud and actually record yourself. So I'll sell my story to people who are not in the industry. That's one thing that I, I really try to do to make sure at least like, are you getting it? Write down or know what you're going to a specific person for. But also do multiple dry runs. You know, if they're saying you're going to have a seven minute pitch, you know, sit and have a timer, which is what we do. And it becomes so important to me that when I'm pitching it to somebody, I care about it so much, right? And I feel like in doing that and my own personal space, I, I develop my own voice and my own uniqueness. How do you bridge um, a specific brief and your own personal story that you want to tell? What was that process like for you in creating a pitch for that kind of context? I can write about anything or come up with a concept about anything. But what I need to do is fall in love with it at a personal level. But I think there's a tension between you know, what sells and what's meaningful and you as a as a creator have to drill into why it's meaningful for you and then when you pitch it make sure that that's coming across yeah and no matter how extraordinary the idea is mm -hmm. um if you can bring it back to something real yeah then you can then extrapolate and create amazing worlds and characters but when you're talking to other creators what must they be sensitive to and bear in mind in terms of getting someone's attention I mean, I think we have to appreciate that these people are constantly being bombarded with people's pitches and they're being exposed to people who think they've got the next best thing all the time. And so, yeah, there needs to be a degree of courtesy there. You need to appreciate where they're coming from. If you approach every project you do as a team project, a lot of things become easier because it's not you pitching to a studio. It's you and the studio hoping to work together to develop something. And ultimately you're looking for a business partner. So it's somebody that they feel um, they can relate to. And obviously you need to show them that you relate to them. Ultimately you're looking for a business partner. That's great. I like that. So what did you all think of that? I mean, you heard it from the horses, I don't know, what's the plural for horse, horse, horses' <laughs> mouths. <laughs> um, <laughs> and my, my biggest takeaway, and I loved it, I loved um, listening to these guys. Um, my biggest takeaway was actually pitching is a people game, right? So it's about connecting. Um, and some of us are different personalities. Some of us um, saying our ideas out loud is very difficult and it's very unusual. And the thing I kept hearing is practice, 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 right? Especially even for some of us that are comfortable talking, you still have to practice being concise and communicating well. So I hope you got that from these guys, that preparation, doesn't matter how confident you are or how, how shy you think you are. When a person is hearing your ideas, whether they're an executive or like Tip or one of the directors said, just an ordinary person in your life, the idea still needs to make sense. So um, testing your ideas out by saying them out loud to an audience is a really good way to prepare for a pitch. So I think Vanessa will say a little bit more on that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you've spent, so, as artists, you've spent so much time thinking about this idea. You've, you've held it close to you for so many years. You've been writing, you've been creating arts. 
And now you start sharing this with people. It's quite a precious thing to do, but you do need to do that. You need need to be, uh, as personality wise, I think in the animation industry, I know as artists are quite, um, what can I say? They're very precious. I think all artists are very precious about what they create. And it's very hard when you share it. And sometimes you get the response you don't anticipate. So we do encourage um, you to practice. And even at our studio in, in South Africa, where we have a director's club, we essentially get together once a week and pitch our ideas because the more you do that and the more questions you get back the better you, your pitch is going to be essentially you know don't hold it so close to you that no one else gets a chance to give you some feedback you'll be surprised um and in in the whole process of your idea becoming something bigger than what you thought it would be it's quite a beautiful thing so be prepared and, and don't um be unprepared or wing it when you come to actually pitching at that meeting it's, uh, it's possibly your one shot. I've been in so many meetings um, over the years at ANSI, at, at all these big kids screen and, and places around the world where you're in a room with Netflix or Disney and you're pitching ideas, you know, this is, could be your one shot to get one executive to go, we're going to give you money to produce that. That's a great idea. And uh, it's quite a scary thing, but it is really, you've got to practice to get there. Um, we wanted to just take you through some a lot of art to say to us, but how do we do that? How do we actually um, pitch our project? And there are a couple of ways to do that. Um, there are 270 they were before lockdown and COVID-19, but I'm sure we'll bounce back even stronger. The 270 international animation festivals and markets each year, it's quite a lot, but what we'd encourage you to do is just to identify some of the really big ones and try to get there. Um, if you're based in Europe, and the sea in France is, is spectacular for young artists. It's very inspiring, and it also is a market. So it's a great place to, to pitch your ideas. And there's these amazing forums where you can pitch in this panel that listens in and gives you feedback on your idea. Um, so that's a really good way to do that. And, and a lot of these festivals, um, if you've been to some of them over the years, they'll have an opportunity for pre-arranged meetings which are essential. So say you decide you want to go to Annecy, um, you, you spend lots of money on that ticket, the accreditation to get there. What I would encourage you to do is to prepare. So say you bought your ticket two months before June, before you go, or before you join online this year, um, 22 is going, 2021 is going to be online again. Go and do some research. You get access to a database, go into that database and essentially stalk everybody who you think you want to pitch to. Because you have a ticket or accreditation, you now have access to data of people who will be available to pitch to or to meet online, um, which is so exciting. So go do your research. Just don't want, you know, one year when we can finally go back to France and be at NC, don't just rock up at a, a Disney booth and go, hey, I want to pitch you an idea. That's not going to work. Um, you really need to schedule that meeting with an executive that your project is suited to, if that makes sense. We'll get into a bit of that in a sec. Um, but certainly when you're about to go to a market, don't wing it, do some preparation, at least start six weeks before you go and start emailing executives and, and people um, and ask if you can meet and they'll be very open, um, no doubt. There's also speed pitching panels and sessions which give you a chance to pitch to a whole lot of people on a panel and there are lots of informal events and networking opportunities, even if it's online. Um, Check out, I think most people are trying to connect people more than ever before because we feel so far from each other and can't connect in one city. Um, try and get to those networking online events and, and find out ways that you can pitch your idea. So that is one way that you can actually get to um, these international festivals and markets. And, and there is a festival, sorry, I'll just bounce one slide back, not to distract you. There is an international festival in Cape Town as well. When we get back to, having a live virtual event. Um, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be a part of Comic Con. And if that's something you'd be interested to come to, there are festivals all around, all around the world. And a lot of people don't know that you can actually do online pitching, which is great in times like this. So Sundance Institute, Amazon Studios, Movie Pitch, and so many others are platforms which essentially allow you to pitch your idea. And then for executives, um, to actually give you feedback. That feedback's invaluable. You might pay a couple of dollars to do that. It's so worth it. The more you get international feedback on your project, the stronger it's going to get. So you want to get your project out there, you want to get feedback, and you want to keep going. Um, 
I said earlier, one of our projects, Kia, with Disney Junior, has only taken six or seven years to get to a production green light where we actually have a studio. We have animation starting and pre-production. Seven years is a long time, so you want to you want to get cracking now. And then in our in our country in South Africa, um, we do have sorry, I'm making you a bit seasick here. Yeah? We do have government funding, and I know that in France or in Ireland or in other amazing parts of the world or in Canada, the government or states are really giving amazing opportunities to artists, especially in animation, um, to to develop and produce projects. So if you're in a country where you think there's going to be some state support look out for that and even in south africa we have some amazing support it's not a lot of money but it certainly can help you write that script or get some concept art done hire some artists you know not ask everybody to do things for free so those are just some ideas on 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 pitching opportunities and you know you're basically pitching to who it's a that's the big question you know if you've during a presentation, you want to know who's in the audience. I ask the Wacom team who's going to be in this audience so that I know how to speak to them and how to reach out to them and what's going to attract their attention. Um, and there are a couple of ways that you can do this. You can you could be pitching directly to your audience. And I know that sounds interesting, but like films like Hair Love, that won the, uh, the Oscar last year in the animation shorts category, started as a Kickstarter campaign and basically asked its audience the world to support them with this great idea um, that Matthew H. Cherry had. And, and as he directed it, he had a whole lot of funding and support from an audience. So the audience directly told them, we love this film, we will back you, here's our money. And the film got made and won an Oscar. How amazing. Closer to home, we have a project called Kariba, which is with a, a very big international studio at the moment in development. Um, but that started as a graphic novel and it started out on Kickstarter as well. Support us as artists making a, um, a first graphic novel to get our story told. They were artists, they weren't writers, and they went into to the graphic novel space, which is quite unusual. And it instantly, your audience, you figure out who your audience are. It's looking at teenagers or looking at young adults who are appreciating your your film and all of a sudden you know your, where your film is hitting so it's quite amazing you get a lot of insights when you go straight to your audience in an online platform and then this is another short film um, that we produced in-house over five years in our little gaps at the studio when we had some time off um, and this project is essentially um, directed and co-directed by Kelly Dillon she was a production coordinator at a studio and how interesting that this project, she reached out to friends in the animation industry, into the arts industry and said, I'm making this short film, what do you think of it? I want to make it. And we did it in downtime at the studios. So how amazing that she she put this film together with friends in studios um, and then finally produced it at Triggerfish because she works at the studio at the time. So, so that's one way where you are actually doing a project and you're taking it directly to your audience. How, how valuable though, because if, if I was Netflix and my project is Kariba and all of a sudden Kariba has a, a following of 500,000 people all around the world, the statistics show this has got a massive following already and it's only a graphic novel, Netflix might sit up and go, hmm, that's very interesting. How about let us make a feature film? Let's take this into development. So it's quite an interesting avenue to getting a project made. It's not very traditional, but it's very, it's, um, it's not unusual for now. And then going to the traditional routes when you are at an anesthesia or you're at a market again one day in the future, I hope, um, and you decide that you're going to pitch your project because you think you have something perfect for Nickelodeon on their junior channel. Um, the idea is to, to know who you're pitching to. So Disney Junior, for example, Nickelodeon and France Television, these are all broadcasters and broadcasters essentially have all this time and they need to fill it. And hopefully they can fill it with your content. Um, and, and the idea is that if you want, want to pitch something to Nickelodeon, you know that it's going to be far more edgy than a Disney Junior. If your story is more edgy than a Disney Junior, these are all just examples, then you know how to pitch to Nickelodeon. You know what they've made. You watch their stuff. You've watched what is, who their audience, who their kids are watching Nickelodeon shows. Um, same with France Television. You know what is being aired, and so you know what they're going to be interested in, potentially. And so you... Make sure your pitch is connected and, and directed to that partner. If you're pitching to a Disney Junior and a Nickelodeon with the same concept, I would kind of tweak your pitch slightly and make it specific to that broadcaster because it'll really like 
they would know that you've made some effort in researching that Disney Junior has a certain audience and these shows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You get my drift. Um, thankfully, these days we've got a very exciting streaming partners who are spending a lot of money, and it's quite exciting because these traditional broadcasters are doing things kind of a little you know, linear, old school way, which is still working um, and massive. But the Netflix, the HBO Max of this world, um, the Disney Plus of this world are really shaking things up, which is so exciting. And, and Netflix specifically is very interested in diverse and unique stories. And if you have something that doesn't really fit in a, a broadcaster model, how amazing, go straight to a streaming platform. You know that your project fits something that is not traditional broadcaster fit. And how exciting that there's a home for that now and that people throw money at you for that. Um, it's always good when people throw money at you for your own project. Um, so these are just some examples of some streaming platforms and some other some other um, people that you can pitch to are distributors or licensing um, companies. And essentially they're, they're buying lots of content and currently they're understanding that they want to develop content in order to be on the mark. So you might want to also look at distributors like a G Kids or Fremantle and speak to them when you're next um, at an, a festival or a market um, that would be worth your while to pitch to them as well because they're, they're in the game to add to give money to creators. Um, all of these people want to work with the artists and that's one thing I've experienced is and Tenda I mentioned earlier. Um, they want the creator to lead the show. Your unique voice is so important and special. Um, if they really love who you are as a person and your show, that's a real win-win. And it's and don't be shy of that because your unique voice as a, as a creator is what a lot of people might be looking for. Um, yeah. I'm just quickly looking at, just quickly going again, this is sort of the basics. If you're looking at a Disney show, Disney Junior is usually preschool. Um, there's all these different age groups and then Adult Swim as a streaming platform that you can subscribe to or um, Crunchyroll um, is a fantastic place for adult animation. So if you've got an idea that's like a, something for adults, then you know where to pitch it next time you're at market or next time you're virtually online, um, you can pitch it to these streaming platforms. So if you don't know this, but you've got that great idea, I would encourage you to research and find out who your show is gonna be pitched at as an audience so that you can speak to a broadcaster who's already reaching out to that audience. Otherwise, you kind of not, you're not using that network that's in place. They know their audience very well. You need to present like you know their audience and you know that they can reach their audience. Um, yeah, I hope that's helpful. And and I think we're gonna we're gonna go straight to another video now because when you're actually pitching, it's you have that one shot. You've got that one shot, it's a high intensity, it's a sales pitch. You've got say five to fifteen minutes, if I recall my NSC days, it's 15 minutes tops and then the, and the executives turn over and they go to the next restaurant or the next venue and you're like sitting there going like, oh, that was hectic. Um, but you've got that small window to impress them, but also just relax in that and know that what you've got is your concept, your story, your design, your character design, world design. If you've got that all in place, I think you, you'd be in a strong position to grab their attention. I think we're going to queue another video, Tendai, and then we can continue. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Vanessa. I just want to um, frame that video a little bit. And so I know for some of us, that is a lot of information. Like if you've never been in a studio environment, if you're a freelancer, I was a freelancer for a very long time. And I remember going to markets and festivals and just looking at all of this branding and these banners and these important looking people and going, where do I even start? Even if I've had an appointment or made an appointment, I'm feeling so overwhelmed. I don't know how I'm going to present my idea. Um, so Vanessa had a slide with just the different age groups and whatever and stuff like that. And you don't have to know all of this stuff by heart. Um, you have to know what film or what idea you're trying to create. And then you do the, do the research on your thing, right? So um, Vanessa spoke about uh, Disney Plus versus Nickelodeon, for example. But let's say you want to do something super... Um, edgy um, with a little more blood or whatever and maybe you're going to be looking at a crunchy role so you're not going to research Dis Disney Junior anymore you're not going to look at Nickelodeon you're going to try and figure out crunchy role right and sometimes it's as simple as 
which streamers or which broadcasters are doing more adult content or more children's content or and you just start there so you just need to know your stuff and your story well enough you don't have to be perfect because um these people's strategies are changing all the time right um and so you just need to know them enough and what their dna is so that once you're in that conversation you've got a starting point and you read interested and you read like you're not just in it to get their money you're in it to build a relationship because they have something you don't have which is a captive audience so it's not just about us as artists it's about us speaking to an audience that might appreciate your art and who knows that audience well yes you know them but so do they so if we come in with a mindset of okay i know a little bit but i know my stuff super well and i know my story super well how do we build a bridge and how do i help you fill your time slots and how do i help you make your audience excited um with my proposition right um and I just kind of wanted to just go back, to Vanessa, to the, the slide you had about belly flop, right? So Kelly, and why I want to mention that is sometimes we see pitching as a sales opportunity to executives, but sometimes pitching like what Kelly did is pitching to her friends. You're pitching to partners. You're going, what, what's the team I need to realize this vision? And she started by pitching to her community and her friends, and then she pitched to her boss, there was downtime, right? And uh, Vanessa Stitch was a production coordinator, so she wasn't even, or a production manager, so she wasn't an obvious director. But you have to be able to sell yourself because often people are buying into you and your ability. And it's one thing to be able to draw beautifully and make amazing music, but if you can't work with other people or if you can't pitch yourself or present yourself, whether it's to friends or streamers, then you're in a bit of a tight spot. So this next video is about that conversation, whether you're pitching to friends or pitching to a big studio or practicing in the mirror, the kinds of things that can happen during the pitch and how these guys manage to kind of work around that. So yeah, here's that next clip. You're in a presentation and you can kind of see the light dim in people's eyes. So they, they're, they're either confused or they're bored or they, um, they start fidgeting. Yeah, they're fidgeting. Yeah. Move on. Choose your words very well. So I don't know is very different from I'm not sure. I'm not sure says there's space for me to figure it out. I don't know says I'm not capable. Has there been an in instance where you've successfully turned around a bad pitch? So you, f you see that suit and tie in the room that's stiff and just giving you a hard time and you've actually turned them around. Have you ever had that happen at all? Um, yeah, so they came with some questions that I didn't have answers to and I immediately started talking and then I could hear myself. I was like, this is nonsense. I was like, you're talking nonsense. I could see it in the room. So then I paused and I was like, actually, I don't know. Like flat out, I said, I don't know. And I gave it a beat. I was like, I'm not sure. But then, and then I posed a question instead of trying to answer. In some cases, like you can notice that, okay, maybe I came in a little too formal. And um, you notice that that one person who's, who's rigid maybe is not formal. And then you just start loosening up maybe the way that you're saying, maybe crack a little bit of a, a little joke. That's something else that sometimes really works for me is that I ask that person the question and you start a conversation. And then what ends up happening is they help you answer the question. Can you share an experience of a pitch that bombed like in the pitch itself and how you knew it was crashing? So I guess that's been my experience of bombing, uh, sometimes being underprepared or even when you're prepared, um, you get in there and it's just one or two characters who don't like what you're pitching and yeah, that's the end of the story. When it comes to the end, give them the opportunity to ask questions. And then you have an opportunity to recover by clarifying a question. Sometimes you pitch knowing that you're not going to get it, but it's just so that you can get in their radar and then they know what you can do. Uh, sometimes when I know that it's going amazing, all right, is that everyone is contributing. Probably my best pitches have been where I've had an appointment, I've sat down with somebody and there's been a little bit of a personal connection where we can talk about ourselves as human beings 
and we find something that we identify around, often something outside of the industry. As I comment on something, I will call somebody's name and then mm. people tend to, to wake Come up. Back, yeah. Because we all love to hear our names, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> you, you kind of establish like that synergy. When you get to that point of synergy with the, with the clientele or like whoever you're pitching to, then you're like, okay, okay, here we are, here we are, synergy, synergy. But the moment they say thank you, and everybody's leaving the room, that little conversation that you have in the whole way out can actually change whatever decision that they had. How has the journey been for you? How have you bridged what the studios asked for, but your own story and your own perspectives? You know, when you're pitching to someone, you gotta, first of all, look at yourself and find out, am I offering the right thing? You know, and if I am, why are they even asking me to pitch? Not everyone's going to like your stuff, but it doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that the person who's listening to it at that time isn't isn't understanding or seeing your vision. I think you have to kind of reevaluate it and just say, and reevaluate is a very key word here. I'm not saying change it, mm. reevaluate it, because what might be wrong with it has nothing to do with the underlying inspiration and idea it's probably just the execution of it at the end of the day everything is a business and everything needs to make money and that's that's a thing that a lot of people forget you know they think it's it's all about having fun but at the end of the day these guys are professionals that's your business so so there you have it um things can go terribly wrong, right? Um, but the thing that I, I, I picked up again from what these guys were saying is that it's almost like every pitch is a practice in a way. It's, it's you're practicing having a conversation and you actually can glean a lot of information from the conversation, even if it goes badly, right? So you can hear what the broadcaster or the potential partner is responding to or not responding to. Um, and it's an opportunity to look at yourself and, and think how you can improve and how you can grow because in fact if pitches don't go badly you don't know what to do differently the next time so um that it can suck it can be really discouraging if it's not going well but it can be an opportunity for a learning experience um and then i just kind of wanted to reflect really quickly on what vanessa said earlier about um kia which is the picture that's coming i think it's up now um and that it took seven years and people hear these long times and they're like, oh my gosh, seven years to get my idea out there. Well, it's because you're collaborating and you're working with people and you're making it better. And so time isn't always a scary thing. Sometimes time is an incubation period to nurture that idea for you to grow, for you to see how to communicate better with an audience and things like that. So yeah, I think um, every pitch is an opportunity to get information, even if the pitch goes bad. Absolutely. And I think as artists, when you're starting to, as Tendo was saying, like it's a team thing, as soon as you know that a Disney Junior, for example, picked up Ninja Princess, it's now called Kia. Um, as soon as you know they're interested, stop talking. You know, as soon as someone's interested, listen. Listen to what they're saying to you. Listen to their ideas. And then you need to, as an artist or a writer, decide, well, is this the best partner for me? Um, is this something that's going to work? Because it needs to work for seven years just for development and then possibly another three years for the first season production. It's a long-term relationship. You know, it might be the longest relationship you've ever had. So make sure you um, you partner up with the right, the right company, the right broadcaster, the right um, project partner, because it's a serious, it's a serious commitment. You can also say no and say, gosh, thanks Disney Junior, this doesn't suit me. You know, this project Ninja Princess has been reworked so many times because as a consumer strategy that's going to be alongside this TV series for, for preschoolers, it's very important the design was right. And so the creators, Kelly, Dylan, as one of the co-creators, they had to step back as a team and say, we're happy for Disney to lead on this. We're happy for the project partner, E1, who, who has big projects like Peppa Pig and PJ Masks. We're happy for them to lead on this. And their experience brings so much to the party. As a, as a, as a creator, um, this other project on the screen, Dog Show with Cat, Mike Scott is a South African creator. He's, he has taken the stance of, well, this is a precious project to me. And the partner that comes alongside get, must get this project. And, I, and he's been very true to himself. So there's different ways you can go on this. You don't have to 
give up everything and have everything change, you could also say, no, this isn't the right project partner for me. It's your choice. See how you feel about it. I'm sharing these visuals just because a lot of people say to us, you know, what do you take to a pitch meeting? Or what do you send at pitching phase? And, you know, really, if it's animation, people want to see art. They want to hear cool stories. So be prepared that you've got a sense of who your characters are. You've got a sense of who, what your world is like. It might not be final production design. It, it usually never is in my experience. It's just a sense of, if you look at this image, for Cloud Life, which is a pitch to, um, in development a TV, for a TV series created by Howard James Fifey and Andrew Phillips. I'm just zooming out so you can see their names. This is not final design as a 2D animation. Um, it could change quite a lot, but they're pitching. They want to get interest from a Nickelodeon, for example, um, and they're wanting that team, Nickelodeon, to come on board and for them to co-develop together. So when you go into a pitching environment, have some art, have some great episode ideas, know who your characters are, know what your world is like, and pitch it as succinctly as you can. Um, what do you, do you, do you share any materials? A lot of people have asked me like, oh, you know, copywriting and like now I'm sharing my materials from Nickelodeon and they can steal my ideas. Do you know what? Those are the partners that have lots of money. You can hold back. You can give an NDA if you like as well, a non-disclosure agreement. The reality is if you're in a pitching environment, your ideas are there to be pitched to them and hopefully they're excited about it. And as executives, they're super busy to be poaching other people's ideas. I know it's not a great answer, but you have to put yourself out there and show off your art um, and talk about your story ideas. Otherwise you're never gonna get that opportunity. Um, so we typically say, if you're in a pitching environment or face-to-face -face with an executive, leave something behind. Often we do an A5 size one pager and it's nice to go, here we go, this is a little reminder of, so that means you've got to prepare art, a bit of copy, something um, dynamic. This was the original Mama K's team for um, one pager. And it was left behind with executives and they held on to it when they flew home. It wasn't a big pitch Bible that didn't fit in their suitcase. Um, it was a one pager that they could go, oh, remember this team? This was phenomenal pitch. Um, sorry about my daughter screaming in the background. Um, it's bath time and dinner time. Um, so yeah, you want to leave a one pager and you want to be able to leave some digital images with them and leave them something that remembers, um, that reminds them of you, who you are and the project and how interesting it is. Um, yeah, so that's my encouragement to use to leave something behind. You don't have to have a full pitch Bible. We've done that before. It's very expensive. It doesn't always work. Um, just something to, to get their interest. So they're interested. What next? Um, I'm going to move quite quickly here because this is a lot of information. Typically what happens next is a lot of months of discussions. Um, if you get somebody like Netflix say we're very interested once you've had this meeting, it could be a couple of months before you have a meeting with the right executive to, to green light some development funding or plans. And it takes a couple of months of negotiations. I would encourage you to, um, to prepare yourself for more development. If you pitch that one pager and, um, and that artwork and that story is where it's at, expect Netflix, if they're excited, to say, let's do some more development. How about it? And development certainly has a, a path. It's usually more art, work with some writers. Are you, are you open to working with a head writer based in California? That kind of discussions. I would recommend you to have a, a lawyer in place because at this point, you know, contracts are going to be coming in. You're going to be talking budgets. Um, their executives, their producers, who is your team? Gosh, you're just an artist with a great idea. Um, I would encourage you to get a producer on your side and a lawyer on your side, an entertainment lawyer preferably. And... And if you, if in this stage you're, you're feeling like this isn't the right partner for you, pull out because as we've all said, it takes a really long time to get a project to production. Um, yeah. And then getting the best deal. A lot of artists come to me and ask, gosh, what is it like um, in this space when somebody's excited, they want to pick up your IP, it's unique, it's yours, and what do they do now? And often people are surprised I really hope things change. Let me just say this up front. Like I really hope that that creators of shows can get more in the long term. But the reality is if you're a first time creator pitching your IP for the first time to Netflix and it's your first gig, your first opportunity, don't expect a lot. 
if, if Netflix are pouring $10 million into development and a further $50 million into production, those are just figures I'm throwing out there, then expect for them to take the, the big slice of the cake. They might leave you a little slice of cake because you're the creator. And I think that's, that's pretty standard. That's pretty normal. Um, some people on artists have challenged that, and I think it's wonderful, but in my experience, and I think it's brave, um, knowing your value and what your project brings to the table. But for most artists and creators, you really just want an opportunity to work with Netflix, right? So often in our experience, we've, the partners will negotiate, um, creators typically get between two to 5% of backend percentage, meaning you know, of anything made on toys or ancillaries, there's a, a, a 5% on anything made. And if you look at Peppa Pig, that made a, a billion dollars consumer sales uh, two or three years back, 5% of $1 billion is quite a nice little piece of 5%, a piece of the pie. So you've got to ask yourself, this is your first gig. There are many more. You have loads more ideas. We know that. So um, get your first project done, do it well, let it be an amazing experience for all the project partners, and then have your next one lined up, and your next, and your next, and then you can be more bold to ask for those increases and those roles. Um, what you do get outside of just the back end is you can you can ask to be uh, credited on the series, of course, you're the creator, that credit belongs to you, but it's a team, so it might be 100 to 100 people on the TV series. Um, you could also receive um, a salaried role if you're an artist or a writer you could also ask for a role on the show um, and then there are bonus payments and all sorts of other things that your lawyer should help you put into that contract so there are layers of benefits remuneration um, to this and yeah i hope that's helpful in just getting a sense of what is currently happening and if you're a first time creator in this space, what you can typically, um, if someone offers you 1%, you can push them to 5%. You know what I mean? You, there's a bit of room here. Um, but if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, Matthew H. Cherry doing Hair Love and somebody, um, he's, he went straight to Kickstarter, produced his short film, won an Academy Award. The next film he's going to do, all of a sudden he has a lot of weight in the room and can demand some fantastic roles, some fantastic percentage. Do you know what I mean? So like, that's typically how these things work. Um, I hope that's helpful. That's some pitching advice from, from us at the Triggerfish development team here in Cape Town. Um, and if you have any more Q&A on pitching specifically, please do let us know. Um, I know that Tenda is dying to talk a little bit more about the kind of projects we we're incubating and nurturing at the moment and unique projects that come from, from Africa um, and why it's important um, to have something that's special to you and, and to know what to do with that story. Yeah, uh, we, we had another video for you on, on um, <gasps> the site. Sorry about that. No, it's completely okay. So if we have time, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll play it at the end. Um, uh, I was sorry, I've just been following the chats and people are showing love for you and your baby. So see, Vanessa Vanessa pitched to you guys very well because she got empathy from you. So that's that's the power of connecting with human beings. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, like in terms of, I, I do think that video is important to you guys because, you know, we can say all the stuff and you're, you've got your game face and you're ready and you go in and you pitch and you're talking to these big money up people. But when you get a no, it's, it's really hard. Um, and so I, I do think it's worth playing that video just to kind of see what people Absolutely. that have been in that pitching seat and gotten rejection after rejection. And um, I mean, like with Matthew LaPerry, La Vanessa, I mean, how long has he been in the game for? Like a long time. And he's been behind the scenes for a long time. And to make yeah. his own film, he had to crowdfund. So he'd been getting a lot of no's, I imagine, a lot of no's. But he kept yeah. going. And here are some thoughts from directors who've been rejected quite a bit and how they've kept themselves going. And then we'll go into a little bit about the diversity stuff. Perfect. Thanks. When you're getting criticism, how do you process it? What are you hearing from it? And how do you translate it? I want people to actually not like something because then otherwise I'm not being creative. If you get married to an idea, it becomes painful when it has a change. And one thing that I've learned is that ideas change a lot. Sometimes the idea that you thought was amazing at the beginning 
turns out to be crap, maybe 20% into the process. Just because you rejected my project, it doesn't necessarily mean you're rejecting um, me in a sense. The best thing you can get from a pitch that doesn't go the way you expect it is someone who gives you good notes. Always open for criticism. Doesn't matter how harsh it is. And that's what you take away with you. You take away the possibility that you can make it better. So when it comes to criticism, I always think of it like, okay, there's something that I don't know that the other person who's giving their opinion knows this is gonna, that's gonna make the project way better because there's a part process that went through their suggestion. Can you talk about how you've had to stretch as, as individuals um, in this business and how you draw from your whole selves to just do this every day. In order to create a lovely piece, it takes time. We are not in theater where we only have four minutes of oxygen that's required before somebody dies. You know, animation is not like life. People don't die. So you don't have to do it quickly. So that for me was the biggest adaptation. When you pitch something, you're basically handing it over to someone. Is it good enough? And if it's not, are you able to, you have wiggle room or are you just married to your idea? And, and that's very important, especially how malleable you are when you your idea has been picked. How malleable am I or is my idea my wife that I don't want someone to criticize? The more you do it, the better it becomes. And two heads are better than one. And the next, you know, the next day, sometimes we, pick, we, we pack things uh, when we are about to pitch to say, okay, let's sleep on it. Tomorrow we'll have a clearer and better way of living. And then, some, and then the, the ideas come. So you go to a pitch, you kill it. It's amazing. You're feeling great about it. Then you get, we regret to inform you. <laughs> what is that like? <laughs> and how do you dig yourself up Pick yourself up and do it all over again. Because I've now gotten used to people saying no, mm. I just, like what you said, you mm. learn to to accept and realize that mm. maybe it's just not the right fit. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually when someone does say yes, mm. it's because it's the right fit, it's the right time. I would say if you stress test any of your own ideas, you, you kind of train yourself how to handle rejection. All the projects that we've done, very few of them came out came out the way that we didn't like. We didn't like them. Most of them always end up better. So when criticism comes, I always think, you know what? At the end of the day, this is going to be awesome. How many? So um, this is to help the project move on forward. I love that. Um, I think it's it's so brave, right? Like. Actually, when you think about it, it, it takes a lot of vulnerability to be presenting a labor of love over and over and opening yourself up to criticism constantly. Mm. So viva to artists, we are very brave people. <laughs> and I, I think it, 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 it's, it's incredible um, making something and then having people poke holes and whatever. So it takes a lot of strength. Um, and just to that strength, um, you know, it's so important to lean into who you are. Um, you, you, we do all this work. Of course, we have to understand the partners that are out there, people that have also, that have their own DNA. Netflix has its own DNA and priority. HBO Max has its own DNA and priority, but so do we as artists. So the kind of stories that Vanessa will tell and the kind of stories I will tell should, should feel different because our life experiences are different. So I think you know, Vanessa was throwing figures like $50 million. So if a studio is going to put that much money in to you and your idea, it has to be bringing something quite unique and special that is in line maybe with certain values and direction, but it has to be different because why pay for the same of the same, right? So as we're seeing now, there's a big movement in terms of diversity and, you know, diversity is such a weird word, actually. It's, it's, it's about representing the world as it is, right? In terms of how different yeah. we are as people, um, sexual orientations, belief systems, life experiences. Um, because if we're not doing that, that means there's an audience that's not being reached. So I would say, um, please be brave enough to speak about the things that matter to you and not to feel like you 
you know, there's the business part, yes, where there are certain boxes that you need to tick, but don't tick a box that encroaches on who you are, um, unless you want to, unless you want to do that, um, but do it knowingly. Um, and the world should see, you know, the range of, of the people that live in it through our stories. And something we were talking about was, um, you know, sometimes um, we feel like, I'm an African black woman, for example, um, but I can partner with Vanessa, who's a white African woman, to tell my story. So teamwork is important and you can collaborate with people that aren't exactly from where you are, but it's just important to understand the vision that you're supporting. Um, and that's how we get diverse stories out there. If we support each other and back each other's visions and help each other tell the best versions, um, of ourselves uh, to the world uh, through our stories. So that's the piece I wanted to say about diversity and that it's important to be unique, but it's also important to collaborate. Yeah, and how exciting more now than ever before, the last, I think of the last four or five years, Netflix really um, breaking the, the landscape uh, wide open that, you know, I'm enjoying German um, TV series, live action TV series, and I'm enjoying animation from Croatia, and how exciting that now more than ever before I'm able to see stories from the world, and it's, and it's real stories, and unique, and authentic stories, and, and how exciting that then as creators, you, you have more, you have more room to play, and to create, which is so exciting, and, and so important to, to understand that when you're pitching to a Disney Junior, or a Netflix, or a Crunchyroll, that, that being true to yourself and what you're pitching and why, that, that should really shine out from the pitch because that's essentially what's going to be the essence of that show. And, and you hope to see that on screen. Otherwise, why are we doing it? Um, because you know that something unique and a, diff and a unique perspective needs to be shared so that um, the world is such a smaller place and that we're so connected. It's so important. And I think then the Netflixes and and the crunchy rolls and all those streaming platforms, which are breaking uh, the old, older linear models, is it, they would see that and be excited by it, and then throw money at you, which is brilliant. And you can keep the lights on and and do your passion your passion job, you know. Um, so yeah, so exciting. We I know that there's been some questions and and um, that we'd love to answer if there's time. Yeah. Um, wow. This was a really, really great session. Thank you so much for it. Um, lots of advice, lots of um, insights, and 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 how to say points where can pe people can relate on on how decisions are made and what is actually happening before some before a project starts, and a lot of lot of touch points people can relate to. Um, it, I saw Tenai, you were following the chat as well. We had a lot of questions, but honestly, I think a lot of questions were already um, answered because by the time the, the question popped up, you were already <laughs> uh, way, way into answering them. So I think it went very well. Cool. Um, um, Great. Maybe a very blunt and straightforward question. So after talking about pitching, what is the best way to pitch to Triggerfish? and how to yeah. get on board into this fantastic team with yours. Well, I'm guessing you're saying how to pitch yourself as an, and you're asking about pitching yeah. yourself as an artist to work with Triggerfish. Yeah. Um, you know, because we have a Galway, an Irish studio now, um, we're working with way more European talent than ever before, which is so exciting. And the best way to pitch to us is really just to click onto our website, go to our careers link, and then see the advertised positions as well as just um, some tips and pointers on how to pitch to us and and what we tend to do is um, is to on social media and on our careers portal to to say who we're looking for talent wise and then and then follow that and and, and just apply that is the best way um, we do have fantastic international interns that also join us yearly so if you're just fresh out of Oblan or some other amazing animation school um, or fine art school Welcome to you to email the team. The email addresses are on our website about an international internship. And we love those because it's such a wonderful experience for our team to be working with international students. Um, and so those are, those are ways that you can reach out to us. Uh, essentially, as a studio, we are a feature film studio who happens to also be developing TV series and short films. 
and many other things. But it's a studio pipeline, we're a feature film pipeline. So if an artist is wanting to apply to our studio, um, it's, it's in the high quality animation space um, where we hope to win Oscars and lots of awards one day. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Um, you. you mentioned, uh, Vanessa, you mentioned a lot of the um, um, creative events and animation-related events across the world, uh, which are a good playground and a good uh, arena to, to get in touch with people, to see what's happening and to tiptoe into, into the industry and, and, and find your way. Most of those events are are shut down right and they, they yeah. had to be cancelled for the last year and probably for quite some time this year based on your experience because i think you've, you've been traveling to a lot of those events or know a lot of them where is a good online alternative um if people want to get a better understanding would you suggest um online animation film festivals or is there a, a kind of platform where people hang out and, and get to meet each other in a more casual way That's a great question. Um, Animation World Network, ORN, um, dot com is a wonderful space for from art to more technical CG artists to collaborate and network. And they have some amazing community forums um, as well. Otherwise, there's CG Society, which is far more technical for VFX. Um, and I think what I would recommend is, and those are all international, is to get onto those social community platforms and connect. Um, in terms of pitching or finding or trying to, to get funded for development or, or um, production, that's really um, those festivals like Annecy or Kids Screen, they are happening virtually. So there are opportunities to meet executives virtually as well. So those are, those are, there are still options for that, um, which is great. Um, I've, I've got a comment on that as well. Guys, COVID has been a blessing in terms of making connections with studios uh, where you would have had to get an air ticket and hotel accommodation to go to a festival. So it means change, that change. everybody's kind of redefining how they talk to partners. So while we don't have all the answers, it means that you are more likely to get an exception to the rule and get a meeting because no yeah. one knows what to do now in terms of communication. <laughs> so there's a little bit of, I think you have to experiment. Um, Please, the one thing you must never do is send like a group email to five different studios and it's the <laughs> same email. It's the same word, uh, worded email, Tail tailor make. Because you never know, maybe there's someone, someone's assistant who's um, reading the general inbox, but because it feels so specific and you took the time to personalize the email and you contextualize it to whoever you're writing it to, they might go, oh yeah. It just so happens that um, my boss mentioned that we're looking for um, a little black girl who's a ninja like ours or you know what I mean so make an effort um, and now's the time to experiment um, so present yourself well I mean I, I was tracking the chat and I was seeing things like um, should I use a reference image and not my own art etc um, just do your homework and be well prepared and it, it's useful to think of yourself if you were in the chair of a person who gets thousands of emails daily what's an email that would get my attention um, and that helps a lot. Um, and just to respond about the triggerfish, can you pitch to us and stuff? Sure. I mean, we, we get um, um, just like, I mean, we're not Netflix by any stretch of the imagination, um, but we also get a lot of uh, communication. So we try very hard to read everything, but we can't always get to everything. So um, if you do write us, We, we will read it at some point. It might just take us a very long time because we are a small team, but we do care about um, art. We do care about artists. We do love building partnerships and relationships, um, but we're also human. So um, we just work through things a little bit slower sometimes um, because of that. But I would just say, um, yeah, experiment. Now's the time to do it. Very good point. Very good point, yeah. Um, we have another question. I want to question. just add quickly, Oh, sure. sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I wanted to say that Netflix and people like these big partners um, that are looking for original content are actually doing amazing um, online courses as well. And it's a wonderful way to build your network. So I'm a part of women in animation um, and African women in animation as well. And I'm aware of Netflix doing these amazing sessions to connect you to these directors, producers, 
um, production designers. So really, I would follow the broadcasters online. Every single one of them is having to make an effort like never before to connect to you and to find out and 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 hook in. It's a lot of work, but it's you know it's what needs to be done. Um, find out what they're doing and and get involved. Good point. Sorry, um, very very helpful advice. Um, talking about networks which relates roughly to a question that came in so um when you, when you develop an idea and, and and you want to get it ready for a pitch you have to basically cover two very important aspects one is the the story itself and the other is the the visuals and how you want to present it and what it should look like but sometimes you've got people who are either better at the one than the other or the other way around how what is the point where I've got to start looking for a partner in, in getting that first idea into a good way and into a good shape by adding somebody who's a good storyboard artist when I am a writer or the other way around? Vanessa, could I, could I go for it? Oh, so I, like, I, I want to answer a part of it and, and I, I don't, I'd love for you to answer the other part of it too, but I do want to speak to just something quite specific. Um, thanks for that question. I also saw in the chat someone talking about an animatic or fast moving image. Don't over deliver, guys. Do not <laughs> over deliver. It, it, it goes back to what is just the best way to give a taste of what your idea is. The story is very, very important. Um, and there's, there've been instances where we've had success with a very strong image. It is worth investing in both, but don't deliver animatics. You don't have to deliver an animatic. You don't have to just, because these things animation. change all the time or an animation so Vanessa you can speak to more to the process of how these things evolve but I just want to encourage you spend your energy creating what you need to create don't expend more energy on stuff that doesn't really matter for this level of conversation yeah you know if you're a writer and you have a, a solid log line a um, an outline that really has, has got people's attention then spend time finding an artist who who you're inspired by as the original creator. Um, what inspired you? What would you like to see this look like visually on screen? And if you can find an artist whose work sort of covers that look from a character design or environment design, find two artists. Um, reach out to those people, those actual artists, if you're inspired by their work and that's where you're headed, reach out to them and see if they'll collaborate with you. If not, I think um, sometimes reference can be used as a latter part of your pitch to say this is where we're headed because development is such a long process for after your pitch that there's a lot of artwork and, and you can then have you'll have some funds to afford artists to join a team but I have one strong image rather than a whole body of, of art um, if that's what you can afford and decide what it is you know often a story moment with your lead character with the villain in a like huge high stakes moment is far more impactful than like like loads of expression sheets and poses and an animatic find that amazing story moment that will blow people's socks off when they hear your log line and more about your story so that's what we'd encourage you spend time on the most impactful less is more wonderful great advice um Maybe one last question, unless you have something that you want to share that we've forgotten to touch on. But um, with the with the industry changing quite a bit, with like new players coming out and new platforms, um, technology, um, where do you see the industry is heading, and where do you think that young creatives that are venturing out into this industry should be aware of or prepare, or is there something where they can take ownership on because they're new and they start afresh. Um, is there anything like shortcuts, inside tips that, that you would say like, hey, this is the next big thing coming? Well, I think from an artist's perspective, I, I would encourage artists, if you're in the environment space, to learn 3D tools, um, especially if you're a traditional 2D artist and this is new to you. Um, one thing I have experienced is the, the quicker you can get into a CG space by using Blender, which is free, um, and it, it might seem super technical, but it's really worth it in terms of um, expanding that world building as an artist. I think I would like to encourage you to start using 3D tools. Um, I think what we've seen more and more is that 2D, when you look at a 2D 
TV series, often when you go behind the workings of the studio pipeline itself is often a hybrid pipeline. Essentially, they're building the world in a 3D space. The characters are rendered to look 2D, but they were 3D built. And so as artists be open to possibly looking into learning 3D tools um, more than ever before, I think um, that's gonna buy you time and money. And you don't have, if you're a 2D artist, you don't, you have to paint a hundred frames versus just building an asset and learning how to be good at that. So I'd like to encourage artists to look at 3D tools. Um, that would be one for me. Yeah, and, and to your point about um, new players coming in, uh, I, as a producer and I, I'm a former broadcaster, I used to work in a, in a broadcaster in South Africa, I'm so obsessed with platforms and the history of platforms and how these platforms work. And I did a bit of homework on, uh, I, I think it's uh, Crunchyroll and how the founders went to the same university. It was a bunch of collaborators that were fans of anime and fine, the, they were illegally pirating and, and so on. But it was, and that's my dog, that's my little baby barking now. Um, but um, collaboration. So I think there's a lot of power power in that, if you can enjoy that barking, I'm sorry. Um, particularly because of what I'm observing now in that the earlier point around pre-existing IP, Vanessa was talking about, um, uh, even in the chat, people were talking about, I, I think I'm gonna write a comic book. I think I'm gonna illustrate, do it, do it, do it. Because um, studio partners, if your thing is super strong on a different platform, they're actually coming to you and going, the thing you already have out there. So I think, um, we're seeing an increase in that. I think obviously there's always been a history of optioning pre-existing IP, but start where you are and form teams and build IP together. Um, and I think interesting things can come out of that. Even you can start platforms if you're more interested in the business end. Um, that's something else you can do. You don't necessarily have to do um, art or write. Um, so collaboration for me, creating IP, um, because I think partners want to see initiative, want to see proven audiences as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> very, very good summary and very, oh, Vanessa, you're on mute. You sorry, to say something? sorry, Ren, I thought I pulled up my hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I know a lot of animators in, in all my years working um, and I often find that animators and, and especially some of the directors we're working with now, they, they are animators, they're modelers, they get stuck in, they want to create. I think it's a really good to step back. And if your future goal is to direct a short film or to direct animation or to write or to, to be the art director on something, then stick to that and focus on that. You can't be everything. If, if you're like the African independent studios, we tend to do a lot, but we don't do everything super well. I would encourage you to do something super well, but have a couple of other things you know as skills in the background as well. So if you're a storyboard artist, it's a wonderful trajectory to direct. If you're a writer, it's a great trajectory to direct. If you're, if you're an artist and you do comic books, it's a great trajectory to direct because you can visually direct. Um, and it is really just all about collaboration, but do that one thing, know where you're headed and focus on how to get there would be my encouragement to you. Don't um, try to animate and model and comp, but you're actually the director as well. Like, just get a team if you can. Find some like-minded people in a, in a, who would also love an opportunity and ask them if they would like to work with you and collaborate with you on this thing. Um, don't, don't do it all yourself. Yeah. Um, one last question which came in, which is, it sounds South African specific, but it's probably true to to a lot of our participants tonight is as a South African, is it worth the effort to pitch concepts to your local broadcasters or basically limit yourself to the local broadcaster or should you go international? Hmm. I know I, I would answer that. Tendai, you obviously have been in the inner <laughs> workings of the SABC. I would say no. Um, if, if you're Yes, I know. If your goal is to create content for a South African audience with the mind that uh, Jabu's Jungle is a perfect animated example. It's a very, it's a fantastic 2D series. Young audience was a, an upskills studio that started with upskilling talent to do 2D animation. Then wonderful, a 
approach the SABC, your local broadcaster, if your goal is to create something that will travel the world, will be a story that will resonate to so many different cultures, then no, I wouldn't. Um, it, just in South Africa, I think as uh, our broadcasters don't have a lot of money, not their fault. Um, so therefore, look to partners who could potentially throw more money at you would be my advice. So I would say yes. <laughs> 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 and I'll tell you why. Because you have to start from somewhere. So um, the stakes are, and so actually, Vanessa, hey, it depends. Actually, that's a that's an MBA answer. It depends. Um, so if if you want to just get your foot in the door at a lower risk, and maybe you're a small team, and maybe you guys are amazing in Blender, and you're a multi-talented team, scale it to exactly what Vanessa's talking about. If you're aware that the local partners have very small budgets, then you have to do your thing at a very small budget. And if it's for a way for you to scale like that, or you find other partners to invest, because I know other, even Jabu's Jungle, um, uh, Vanessa, it's a way to get in. It's a way to prove yeah. yourself, right? And then you grow from there and you grow from there and you grow from there. So maybe you're going to a local broadcaster and you're pitching five episodes of a seven minute, uh, three to five year old targeted show with three characters in it and a bit of music because your friend is a music composer. Do it, do it, do it, do it. And then you're learning and you're practicing how to build a pipeline, you're learning how to deliver, then you scale up. And then maybe you'll get a meeting with Netflix because you actually have shown that you're able to execute and so on and so on. So ask yourself why with whoever you decide to talk to, like that earlier yeah. video and what Vanessa opened with, ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? Who is the story for, etc. Yeah. And then, and then also, don't uh, also pitch to a Comic Con. You know, there will be a comic online Comic Con, the Cape Town International Film Festival, Animation Festival. You know, there are opportunities there for pitching and to practice pitching and to be with a community who you could also pitch to. And often you'll find uh, not only just broadcasters, but you'd find funding partners within South Africa on those panels, and they could offer up, you know, two hundred fifty thousand rands here or a million rands for production. So there are other pitching opportunities as well um, within just, just in the South African space. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that for that answer. I think it resonates with a lot of people, um, not only in South Africa, because that's the age old question, like where, where do I present myself and to whom do I pitch? And as you said, Tendai, check why you are doing something and what is your story about and then find the right audience is, is possibly the best way to make the right mm. steps. Thank you so much. Um, it was a great session. It was a pleasure watching you and uh, listening to you, full of advice and really, really good uh, tips. Um, I think it was, uh, was very enjoyable and very insightful. So thank you ever so much for being here with us today. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah Always you. welcome, Thanks. sure. Okay, to all of the people who joined us today, thank you all for being here with us. Um, final reminders, please do go ahead and follow our speakers. Show them some love on social media. Um, they've got good portfolios. Triggerfish is an amazing, amazing studio and they've got really, really cool stuff happening for them. Um, don't forget to check out our special offers for you. The offer is valid in Wacom EU and UK eStore and is a time-limited offer. Use the code KAREER20 to get your 20% discount on selected products. Thank you again to our speakers. Thank you again to our audience. Um, today is studio day and the next session is up at eight. Um, and we will be talking to uh, Andre from THU, which is one of... Uh, on the bigger creative events. Um, and we will be talking about nurturing and developing young creatives. And especially in the times where those events cannot take place, it might be interesting to see what alternatives there are and what to look out for in this situation. Until then, enjoy your coffee break, um, relax a bit, go for a walk as long as the sun is still out there and see you back soon. Thank you again to our fantastic speakers and uh, stay creative.